Howdy, everybody. Eric Allard here at Tilson Homes, joined by... Dawn Dantzler. It's good to see everybody. We hope you're having a wonderful Independence Day. Uh, we decided this today to give you guys a special treat and air some of our past live shows so you could get a little inspiration for your new home. So we hope you guys enjoy these re-airs. There's some great videos that you guys have really thought very popular. Hope they help out. Hope you're having a wonderful Independence Day. God bless Texas and God bless the USA. Y'all have a great one. Enjoy the show. And howdy, everyone. Welcome to Tilson Live. I'm Eric Allard, part of the fourth generation of the Tilson family, joined this week, as I am every week, by the great, the wonderful, the masterful Don Dantzler, Tilson's Vice President of Marketing and Customer Experience. Welcome, Don. Hey, Eric. How's it going? It is going really, really, really well. Um, I'm very excited about today's topic. But yes. before we get into that, I want everybody to drop us a howdy. Tell us where you're watching from. Tell us where you're building. We are live on Facebook, live on YouTube, live on Vimeo. For both of you that watch on Vimeo, welcome. Um, but yeah, do drop us a comment. Answer. Oh, sorry. Yeah, yeah you can answer the questions for us. That would be yes, optimal. Yes, just answer each other. We'll watch. It'll be great. Perfect. <laughs> yep. Um, but no, ask any questions you want to ask about the build on your lot process, about building a custom home design questions, financing questions, site preparation questions. We are here to answer all of that stuff for you guys. Uh, but uh, we do have a very special topic to talk about today. And it actually came from some feedback from uh, both customers and our construction team. So mm -hmm. Don, what is it that we will be discussing today? So today we're going to talk about how to read a floor plan because they really do very much seem to be written in a foreign language. Um, you get, yes, you get that wonderful, very big piece of paper that Eric just held up and you're like, what are all these numbers? What are all these letters? What does all this mean? So um, what you guys are getting is they literally handed me a floor plan and I highlighted everything I didn't understand and we're going to explain it to you today. <laughs> yeah. So this kind of goes back to the the roots of the Tilson Live, why we started doing some of these things. Um, they were They were kind of a a quick pivot from uh, our in-person seminars uh, back during whatever it was two years ago that happened that changed everything. And so, but now we've got, there's some real important things because each and every person who builds a custom home, whether you build it with Tilson or anybody else, you will need to review a full set of plans. And mm -hmm. probably your builder is going to ask you to sign off approving those plans that yes, I've seen them. Yes. Uh, I understand what's on them. <laughs> Okay, and, and Don will tell you right now the number one lie told on the internet. Don, could you please disclose to the audience what is the number one lie told on the internet? I have read the terms and conditions. <laughs> yes, I have read and accept the terms and, terms conditions. and conditions. Click that box. Uh, no, you have not. No, I have not. Nobody watching on here has done that. So, um, you know, if you have read a full set of T's and C's, you would never sign it. So, absolutely. Uh, but we don't want that to be the case with your plan. So. We want to, again, we firmly believe that the happiest customers that we have are a well-educated customer when it comes to building a home. So we're going to try and remove some of that fear, remove some of that unfamiliarity with this part of the process, because there are some really, really important things that we do rely on your feedback to do. It is mm -hmm. your dream home. It's your forever home. So um, when you're sitting down with your consultant and going through the, uh, the things that were changed and making sure that, that you understand everything, it could be a little... It could be a little overwhelming. You could glaze over. You know, you got to be careful not to be distracted by too many things. Don't have this out. Take a picture. Mm -hmm. Do the Instagram and Facebook post. We want you to do that, but don't do that while you're reviewing the plans. 100% um, focus on that. But Don, we got some folks joining us. Should we should we shout out to them first, and then we're going to get into this presentation? Yes. I think this is going to be a lot of detail. Yeah, so I want to give a shout out to Ms. Oh. Garner. Um, she is watching from Santa Rita Elementary with her class. So. Okay, so stop real quick. Yes, yeah. I hear we have a whole class from uh, so Santa Rita Elementary School watching a geometry class specifically. Mm -hmm. And so uh, we are going to talk about definitely some things like square footage and slope, rise over run. So yes, in fact, kids, there are things that you learn in school that you will use the rest of your life. This is one of them. So yes. shout out to you guys. Thanks for watching. Great job, uh, Megan, Miss Garner for for uh, having your kids watch this. So we hope it's informative to them. Yep. And then we have Will saying hi from Klondike. Howdy, Will. We got Julie coming in from Johnson City, building the Live Oak. Awesome. Oh, nice. 
We got Cindy coming in from Levon. Beautiful, Levon. Yes. Uh, we got Wesley. Hello, y'all. Great to see Howdy, you. Wes. Great to see you again, Wes. We've got Leslie coming in from the spring office. All right. Uh, we got Jesse getting closer to breaking ground. Awesome. We'll be here before you know it. Uh, we got Manuel. Howdy from Victoria, Texas. Hope to learn more about Tilson. Thank you for this live. Thank awesome, you for tuning yeah. in. Thanks for watching, yeah. We got Tynan coming in from Waxahachie. <laughs> What's up, Tynan? And we got Cindy. I love looking at floor plans at this point. <laughs> Looked at what seems like hundreds. Well, yeah. sorry. Yeah, it can get that way. But now we're going to actually explain to you what it all means. So maybe you'll enjoy them a little more. And we got Tracy coming in from Henley. We're building a Frio and waiting on electrical yep. so Welcome, we can Tracy. have some inspections. Awesome. We got Lisa from Fort Worth building in Possum Kingdom Lake. Nice. We got Chris from Fort Worth. We just finished Hi, our design review with Darla last week. Awesome. Great. We got Sam and Smikia. Howdy from Port Lavaca, planning to build in Tivoli, Texas. Oh, did yeah. I get that okay. one right? Yes, you did. Yes, you did. Yay. <laughs> you put the emphasis on the right syllable. Work yes. on that one, kids. We got Ashton. Hello, guys. Finally got my stakeout day. Yay. Fantastic. We got William coming in from Austin. What's up, William? We got Erica from East Texas. I like East we Texas. We got James and Heather from Marble Falls. Beautiful. We got Tara, who is a homeschooling mama with her kiddos, okay. too. Hi, kids. Howdy. Uh, looking at our plans while they put on our roof. Awesome. There you go. Yeah. If you don't think geometry is important, walk out there and watch those framers for about five minutes, and you'll figure out real quick how important geometry is. Yeah, absolutely. It's a big deal. We got deal. Kathy coming in from Colorado. Welcome, Kathy. We got Julie. Good afternoon. So glad to see this topic. Well, good. Glad, glad that you're tuning in. We got Faith. Howdy from our OSCs. Hello, Miss Faith. Good to see you. We got Talon coming in from San Marcos. What's up, Talon? And then we got Barbara from Sugarlands building a Whitney D in San Marcos and Wimberley. Nice. We got Julie, who is proud of my pronunciation. <laughs> we got Patty joining from League City, planning on building in Washington County. Okay. And then I see we have Nora from Dallas building on the shores Richland Chambers. Nice. Just had our design meeting with Cheyenne and Melissa. Awesome. And then last one, Polly from Grape Town, Texas, near Fredericksburg, doing our yep. wait time. Seriously, can't wait to start. Hang in there, Polly. Yeah, hang in there. We got you. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. All righty. So without further ado, guys, keep dropping your questions and comments into the chat. Kelsey is monitoring that, of course. Um, so we've got, we've got great help there. We'll post the questions. We'll answer all of them. We'll be here as long as we can. Um, but we are going to get into this presentation because there is a lot of detail we want to get to. And Don worked incredibly hard on this. <laughs> And um, yeah, this is a good information you're going to need to have. So Don, what are we doing? All right. So we are going to learn how to read a floor plan. And first, you're going to see a statement you don't usually see on our lives. It's always true, but we kind of wanted to um, make it clear on this one that everything that we're showing you guys, um, plans are very much a proprietary thing. So all of the plans and materials that we're showing today are copyrighted to Tilson. Don't, please don't steal them and try to build them with somebody else. All rights reserved, all that good stuff. Because um, we're going to be showing you a lot more detail than what you normally see on our website. Um, we have four different types of plans that we typically draw um, with different versions. And as you get into the different levels of plans, there's more details. So we're going to be showing you guys stuff that typically you'd have to be in a design center to see. Um, usually you would see this, this online plan, which is super simplified. Um, it's just showing you kind of the basics. Uh, we're calling out, you know, special items and giving you the measurements, but really that that's what you can usually publicly see on our website. And today we're going to show you a little bit more, more details. So just wanted to call that out ahead of time. Yes. So then, and, and thank you, Don, for doing that, putting that together. But yeah, so, you know, guys, look again, we go way more on the transparency and candor side than any other builder uh, that you're ever going to talk to. We put this stuff out here. It's free. We don't gate it. We don't make you give us an email address. We don't make you sign up for a webinar that you have to attend at only seven o'clock on a Wednesday night or something crazy like that. Like this is it. It's out there. We put it out there forever. It sits on YouTube forever. It sits on our website mm -hmm. forever. Like we're not hiding anything, but uh, out of respect for our family's business, this is like this is how we make a living, uh, and yep. how everybody who works for us makes a living. So that's why we put that on there. Uh, and by it was you know to go with the terms and conditions comment. How could we not at least put this on there? So, <laughs> Absolutely. 
All right, Don, take it away. <laughs> All right. So usually what everybody I'm sure is very aware of is our online plans. Um, they are very simple. This is our Palacious. Um, and every plan that we're showing you today is a Palacious, um, just so everybody can, you know, we're showing you the same plan uh, throughout the presentation. And really, they're just kind of simplified um, to show you the key features. Um, so there was a couple of things that we, I've got some some zooms in, zoom ins on the next slides that kind of call out what we're doing. So we've got call outs that, that highlight things like, hey, there's a raised ceiling here, or this is an eating bar, just kind of indicating what's going on. This is an island, this is a desk. Um, so trying to make it as easy as possible um, for everybody. And we're showing the room dimensions um, in every room. Um, so you can see those where you're seeing a dotted line, that's where there's kind of, it's either you know in that back, that's where the ceiling height is changing. Uh, where you're seeing it kind of in between walls, that means it's a sheetrock opening rather than a door. Um, so just kind of the little indications of what's going on there. Yeah, and we're giving you the interior dimensions at this mm -hmm. point. So inside wall to inside wall. And this is so as you're shopping, you're comparing room sizes, all that kind of stuff. It's so that you can really compare apples to apples. Figure out is your furniture going to fit, that kind of stuff. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Um, and then there's actually a little code there to those exterior walls um, that I wanted to highlight because we get a question, we get a lot of questions about are the houses full brick because you can see our elevations and obviously you can see on the front what the materials are. But actually in the floor plan itself, if you look at the exterior walls, you can tell um, what those materials are. So if it's just a solid black line um, in Tilson world, that means that this is going to be hardy siding of some sort. Um, so just siding, no masonry. Um, if you see the symbols below where you've still got that salad line and then you have a lines added around it, that's when you're seeing full brick. So if you've got that, the kind of hashed line, that one's full brick. The one below it, which kind of gets into this like crisscrossy pattern, that means stone. And the one below that where everything is kind of lined up like this, that means that it's some type of a masonry wainscot. So that's where the masonry is coming you know, a little bit less than halfway up um, and there's going to be some type of water table at the top. Um, my drafting department tells me that if the, sometimes the lines are closer together, that means brick. If they're further apart, it's stone, but it's like this much different. So just it's some type of masonry. Look at the pretty, pretty picture on the front to figure out which <laughs> <Yeah>. one it is. <laughs> exactly. Uh, porch posts are another one that you can kind of tell the materials by what it looks like. So this one at the top, if you see a really thick, uh, square with that that outline around it. That's a composite post. Um, next to it, you've got that same size square with then the little hatchy hatchy around it. That means it's got some type of masonry around the bottom of the post. So the base. It's hatchy is not an architectural term. Just just, but it's a layperson. It's an official word. <laughs> just made it here. Yeah, somebody told me the technical term, and I'm like, yeah, nope. Nope. All right, right, if you see a little square with nothing around it, that means it's a rough sawn wood post. Mm -hmm. And then if you see an even smaller little square with what looks like bricks around it, that means it's a rough sawn wood post that has a masonry base. And those are generally going to be smaller than the, the regular rough sawn. That's right. And that is what you're looking at online. Um, the second type of plan that, that you're going to get exposed to, which adds in some more detail, is what we call a work copy. Um, you'll also hear if somebody starts using letters and numbers, they call it an A3. Um, but that is your work copy. And these are available for every single plan and every single elevation that we offer. Um, you do need to go to the design center to see them. And this is where we really start adding so much detail that you could honestly take one of these and build our house. From it, So this isn't something that we can email to you or let you take a copy home to review. And, and that's kind of why, uh, because there's a whole lot of detail. Um, what gets added into these is things like your flooring schedule. So it's going to list out what type of flooring material is in every single room. Uh, what are the veneer percentages? So this is where when your ACC says you have to be 60% um, masonry, this is where you would go to look to find that number. Yep. Uh, it's going to have all the detailed measurements, both inside and outside. There's going to be an electrical layout um, shown on the floor plan. So where everything is wired to, you're going to see all four sides elevations and then actually layout details for cabinetry. So this is where it breaks down what's actually included in that kitchen, what's included in the bathroom, those kinds of things. 
And when you start moving forward with us, this is the copy of a plan that your design consultant's actually going to start to pull out the red pen and start writing on um, to indicate all of the changes that you're going to make. Um, yeah, and that- these are these are not uh, handed out. These are these are for our salespeople's use. They are mm-hmm. scaled. So again, yeah, these, these are not even when we make little red changes on them. We're not handing those out. That goes to our drafting department for them to then produce the next thing. But they do have a little more detail. They are to scale again so that a salesperson can sit there with you with a scale and a red pen. And, you know, the, like the Vernier percentages, we're measuring square footage. We're measuring square footage of floors. And we'll talk more about that in a minute. Yep. Um, so this is just more detail on what I was talking about. So the flooring schedule, that's what that chart looks like. Um, so it's actually going to break down by room um, what material you know, is being used. So it's going to, first it's going to say, okay, here's all the places where it's carpet. And then it goes by room and lists out the actual square footage of carpet used in each area. And then it'll say ceramic tile and do the same thing. So if you were changing any of your flooring materials, this is where you should be seeing your consultant making notes and scratching things out and changing them. Lots of red pen here if you don't want that ceramic tile um, everywhere. Yeah, and a lot of these are done just really for the benefit of the of the sales consultant when you're, hey, I want to upgrade to vinyl plank in these three mm-hmm. rooms. They're not sitting there trying to measure every single one of those while you're sitting Figure there. Figure out like, what's that square footage. It's, it's right kid. there for yeah, them, so. our, our design drafting department's kind of yeah. kind of giving them the, you know, back in the day, we had to do it ourselves. Um, but And that's when we learn salespeople are bad which is why, <laughs> Which is when we learn we should be part of the plans. So the guys like Eric don't mess this up. Um, yeah. But it, it is important. You got to know link times width. That has to happen. So yep. it's a big deal. And then the uh, next thing you're going to see is an area chart. And that's going to list all your square footages. So it's going to talk about your heated, which is also air conditioned. Heated is just the, the architectural term. So um, it's going to measure out this is your, your heated area, which is what we call the, the livable square footage. Um, so that's everything that's conditioned space. And then it'll also list out the rest of your slab area. It's, called, it's going to call it unheated, but this is where you'll see square footage for front porches, rear porches, and garages. So any any room, you know, anywhere where there's slab, that it's not it's not a conditioned space. And you might find if someone sits here and does the math, this this 1,374 square feet plus this 492 does not equal 2,268. What, mm-hmm. what what is going on? Are we are we we, Generally speaking, builders... we don't put flooring under the walls. Right. Yeah. So that that livable space is is actually measured from brick ledge to brick ledge. It's from outside or hardy plank outside to hardy plank outside. And we do it the exact same way that all the taxing entities, your local county tax assessors, that's the way they calculate it. Um, it's it's the total area of the building minus porches and garages. Mm-hmm. So. Um, it does include those void spaces like under cabinets, like you're still getting that living area. And in like, like Don said, those interior walls and exterior walls, those are all counted as living area. Um, and that's, how, that's just the way it's done in, in Texas. And broadly speaking, that's the way it's done in, in all of America. So, Yep. Yep. And like Kelsey's pointing out, the livable square footage is what we list as the square footage on our website when you're searching mm-hmm. for our plans. Thank you, Kelsey. Um, the last chart that you're seeing is the exterior veneer percentages, and this is just telling you what percentage of the exterior of the home is what material. Um, generally speaking, we are going to throw glass in with whatever masonry category it's sitting next to, um, because that's what most of the architectural review committees do. Um, if they don't want it counted that way, we can recalculate it and change up how it's counted um, on your plan. But by default, we include windows as masonry. That's right. And the reason for that is because their windows are more labor intensive than just a wall. Uh, mm-hmm. That's where most of your waste comes from when you're doing brick or stone. Uh, that's where a lot of the, the detail work comes in. So you got a windowsill across the bottom. You have to have finished ends all the way up and then you have a lintel or a piece of angle iron across the top. So windows, windows create labor for masonry folks and they need to know the square footages. So again, mm-hmm. link times width, it's customers that want to go from brick to stone. Your sales consultant will have to know how to calculate how many square feet that is. This is just kind of a little shortcut to help them do that or a, ra- a way to check for accuracy. Yep. All right. You're also going to see all of these wonderful symbols sticking out of the walls and in the ceiling uh, when you're looking at the floor plans of the A3. So this is just sort of a cheat sheet um, to what you're looking at. And so anytime you see a circle in the ceiling with an X, these are generally going to be in bedrooms and in the hallways leading to bedrooms. These are going to be your smoke detectors. Um, So we're noting where all of those are located. 
Uh, when you see little sticks with a circle sticking out of the wall, that's an outlet. Um, if there are two lines, it's your regular 110 volt. Um, if you see three lines, that's your 220 volt that's going to be used for those larger appliances. Um, anywhere you see what looks like a dollar sign sticking out of a wall, that's your switch. And the number of dollar signs is the number of switches on the wall. Um, and we were talking, theoretically, there's dotted lines showing what that switch should control. Our electricians are human. Sometimes they get switched around, but generally it's right. Yeah. Um, and then you've got the funky little line with a square at the end. That's your TV coax. Um, and then you have a circle with a little arrow pointing. That's your cat five that you can use for either internet or phone, whichever one you choose. And then looking at the ceiling, you're going to see if you see the circle with no X, that is a recessed ceiling light. Um, so the little, little puck lights up in there, that's what you'll see the thing below it. That looks like a ceiling fan surprise is a ceiling fan. And when you see it like that, with the four lines coming out of it, that means it's a ceiling fan with a light in it. If there were no light, there would be no lines. Um, but ours default to a ceiling fan with a light kit in it. If you see the circle with the four lines coming out of it by itself, that is some other type of ceiling light that is not recessed. So that's something you want to pay attention to if you were trying to switch switch things out. You want to make sure that, that you got the right light. And then the last thing, which is all the little circles coming out of the walls, those are your vanity lights that you're going to see over your bathroom mirrors. And the number of circles is the number of light bulbs in the fixture. That's right. All right, windows. This is where we really get coded. So when you're looking into the wall, you're going to see all these fancy numbers that I've, I've color coded for you. Um, so this is two walls next to each other, which is what the two is in front. It's indicating we have two windows. Um, and those windows, that 30 that you see, the first two numbers are the width in feet and inches. So this particular, these particular windows are three feet, zero inches wide. The next two numbers are the height, same thing, feet and inches. So these windows are five feet, zero inches tall. And SH means that these are single hung windows, which means they open from the bottom. Um, you may also see FX here. That's our other common one that you'll see, which means it's a fixed window, it doesn't open, it's just a solid pane of glass. Um, and then you might also see notes like TEMP, which means it's tempered glass. That's the kind of glass, kind of like the windshield on your car. If something hits it, it's going to shatter. So this is normally if it's close to a door where the handle on the door might hit, might possibly hit a window, you would want that to be, be tempered glass so you don't have large shards of glass around. Or you might see OBSC obscured. Um, you'll usually see that in a bathroom if you want that window over the tub to be obscured glass that people won't be able to look through. Um, the next thing after this, it'll either say DL or this won't be there at all. Um, if it says DL, that means it's divided light, um, which means it's one of those windows that kind of has a pattern in it. We don't specify on the floor plan itself exactly which style it is, just that it does have some type of style to it. Um, to see the actual style, you need to look at the elevation, but this is just indicating that it, there's something going on in the window. Um, and then the blue is the header height. And this is something check with the architect or builder that you're working with, because some builders do it differently. We're traditional because we've been around for 90 years. And when we're calling something a header height, we believe that you should actually measure to the header. So we measure to the top of the window. So this is the distance in our plans from the floor to the top of the window. So to the actual header. Um, in this case, it's six feet, 10 inches. Uh, some builders re you know, measure to the bottom, which technically is a footer height, but they'll still call it a header height. So just kind of ask what's going on there. Yeah. And then what would, you know, a header course is that piece of uh, lumber material that carries the weight. If you have a window or a door, obviously you can't put studs down the middle of it to hold the wall up. So you have to have something to span that load. And that's what a header is. So again, most of these notes are things, particularly these more detailed ones, are mm -hmm. to, to tell a framer, hey, when you're framing for this window, you need to place this header at six foot, 10 inches, and then the window will go in there. In other words, a five foot tall window, you don't want to put it all the way on the floor. You got to have enough right. space for baseboard and an outlet maybe, and then a little bit of sheetrock, and then a windowsill that has an apron underneath it. So you got to have some space below that window to achieve that. We needed, uh, we needed hung higher than how tall it is. So we were telling them what yep. that means. 
And for your purposes, like you kind of want to look at these to make sure with your header heights, when you're comparing to the height of your window, you want to make sure your windows are all lined up. So typically we align the bottom of the windows, but so if you wanted something different, you need to, yeah. you need to, to speak up. All right, doors. So this is a front door and we've got the same kind of code going on. Um, so first thing I did want to call out in the red, you can see the door swing by the dotted lines. So pay attention to which direction the door is opening. In this case, this is a front door. It's opening into your house. Um, but you'd want, you want to pay attention to that to make sure that the door swing in the way, the way you want, cause it's hard to undo it once you build a house. Um, so pay attention to that. Um, but same thing going on. Um, the first two numbers are going to be your width in feet and inches. So this is a three foot wide door. Um, the next one's your height. So this door is six foot, eight inches. And then this particular door has side lights. So we're indicating that there's two of them. SL means side lights. And we're only going to show the width. And that is one foot, zero inches. Yeah. So it's just assumed that they will be the same height as the door. On some of our designs, we're using side lights. On other designs, we have windows. They're mm -hmm. actual windows beside the door. So be sure that you're asked for clarification on that or maybe uh, take, take a look at the model if there's one there. And hey, is this side lights or is it windows? It'll be yeah. labeled as such on the plan. So. And the difference is a side light is actually the same material as the door. It's glass put into the same material. So if you have a wood door, you have wood surrounding your side lights. If it's a window, it's actually a sheetrocked opening and it's, you know, cased out like a normal window. It's just going to be a fixed window. And in that case, you would see each window would have its own set of measurements. Okay. With this, Eric, we have a question about what does AW mean when it's on a window? Typically what I've seen is it's a, it's an awning window. So it's not, not dissimilar from a casement window. So it's one that has a crank on it. Uh, so really the only difference between a casement and an awning window is casement windows open like this, uh, awning windows open like this, They're the same mechanism. Okay. Uh, places we'll usually see those if we do see them would be like in a, a in a secondary bathroom, maybe above the tub shower area. Uh, you see kind of a, a four foot wide by maybe six, uh, 18 inch tall, one foot, six tall window, uh, with a little piece of hardware on it. You can crank that up and the window will open. Like okay. that. That's how you close it. So that's that's what an awning. That's how I typically see an awning window labeled. And casement would be CSMT casement window. All right. Makes Bonus. Sense. All right. Cabinetry details. This is where we get into a lot. So I've only highlighted it on some of them. Um, in this one, to indicate the door swing, you've got the dotted the hash dashed lines that are kind of coming together at an angle. Wherever the point is, that is where the hinges are. So. When you see it like this, it means it's going to open like that. Uh, so that you want to, you know, kind of keep an eye on that. Um, then you're going to have, you know, everything's kind of kind of marked for these as well. Um, the purple kind of showing you what a wall cabinet, because the, the measurements are going to be different depending on what you're looking at. So wall cabinet measurements are going to show you the width in inches and then the height in inches. So this one's 30 inches wide, 24 inches tall. When you see a hyphen like that, it the next number is the depth of the cabinet. So this cabinet is going to be 14 inches deep. And we only do that if it's different from the other cabinets. Yes, yeah. so we only do that if it's different from the rest of the cabinets, just to notate this one. This one's special. <laughs> and then that BPD means that it is a bi-parting door. So it's two doors coming together. They're going to open like this. Um, so that's what that indicates. Um, in the turquoise, you've got the CWC. What we are looking at is one wall of the kitchen. And so this is the wall and then there's cabinets coming out from it. So that CWC is a corner wall cabinet. Um, so that's what that's indicating is that it's a special cabinet that's got the corner pieces um, going to it. Um, and then you've got the same, same measurements uh, there as well, width and height. Um, on your base cabinets, they all have the B in front of them, which means base. Um, and the first thing, what Eric's kind of pointing to in that, that blue color is a BF base filler. So what that is, is it's a strip that's just filling the space between that cabinet and the cabinet that's next to it. And in this case, BF3 means it is three inches wide of filler material put in there. Um, in the center, in the yellow, you've got your base oven cabinet. That's what the BOC stands for. That first number is the width. Uh, we only notate height on base cabinets if it's different um, than what our normal base is. 
So in this case, you've got a 33 inch wide cabinet and then you have that little dash and that's telling you that it's 27 inches deep on that cabinet. Um, you'll also see callouts for special features. I did not list all of them. I'm just <laughs> listing the Too one that, that's here. There is a cheat sheet um, on the plans that you can go through with your consultant. In this case, what we're showing is you see the two sets of dotted lines that are going horizontal. Those are your slide out trays. So this is the one with the, the trays in it. Instead of having shelves, these have slide out trays that come with this kitchen. All right. And that's everything you never wanted to know about cabinets. <laughs> but, and now John, we'll we got some questions that have piled up and we're folks. Absolutely. We all keep putting your questions in the chat, where you're watching from, where you're building. Um, we're going to switch over here while, while Donna looks at some of those questions and mm -hmm. we're going to look at stuff. All right. We got Jen and Ray who are sharing that their electricians are on site in Atascosa. Nice. Um, Will was very excited that someone was working with Cheyenne. He thinks she's awesome. So thank we agree. You for that. We agree. Uh, we've got Clyde telling us hello. Howdy, Clyde. We've got Carolyn, howdy from Austin. Just finished our stakeout last week for a Travis D in Fredericksburg. Awesome, how exciting. Whoop indeed. Um, Doug is asking, I realized during design process we don't get copies of design. Is there ever a point in the process where we will get a copy of everything? Yes, yes. we will. And we'll show um, you what that's gonna look like today. Yes, yeah, we will. So you won't get a copy of the original one, but once the um, drafting department has gone through and made all the changes that you want, you will get a copy of that for you. And then there's also a final copy um, that comes out. Yeah, and one of the big one of the big reasons for that, by the way, Doug, is is it's really really dangerous to have multiple sets of plans floating around. <laughs> Wonder now they're they're all dated, so we do date them. We date revisions on them, but that's even another different finer detail. Uh, but you can imagine the chaos that could ensue if the customer has a set uh, that may be outdated and we have a set, the salesperson's got a set, final, the, the building superintendent's got a set, who, by the way, we give plans to all the, the framers, sheet rockers, you know, trim carpenters, paint contractors, they all get sets of plans. So it's really, really, really important that there be one, one set. final set of construction plans. That's why changes mm -hmm. in the field are so, so important to not have happen right um because trying to get everybody that's affected by that change a new either options in them color selection set of plans is you just almost can't get it done mm -hmm. um so anyway great question yes you'll get it all right uh, we got theo and kriya checking in from robertson county we got forms last week for our polidoro awesome Congratulations. That's exciting that's awesome. Um, we've got Lilo. Is there any difference between work copies and the ones we already got? If so, and we missed anything, does it count as extra fee for changes in case we need to change what we couldn't see in the copies we have? So the work copies you wouldn't have gotten probably, mm -hmm. um, or we really shouldn't have gotten. Uh, so, you know, I don't, the, the only time that you're going to get charged for changes on to your plans is if you make changes after you sign them. So if you've signed your plans, which would be the file copy of plans, which we'll show you in a little bit, um, and you make a change after that, then yeah, typically, yes, that's where the that's where the charges come in uh, because they have to go back to design and drafting and be redrawn. So okay. if it's something like since you've, if you did your initial contract with the changes on like an e-ticket that we give you and you haven't reviewed or signed your plans yet, then you there wouldn't be just a charge to change that. It would just be the charge for whatever you decide to change, whatever item that it is. Okay. I hope that helps make sense. That makes sense. Um, Julie has a specific question about the refrigerator. So mm -hmm. REP 1.5 times 96-27 for refrigerator space. Yeah. So what it could mean uh, is there's a, a type of filler or a, uh, a return piece. So we kind of, if you'll notice on some of our models, some of the pictures, if you go to the virtual tours, we kind of trim the, the refrigerator space out with cabinetry to make it look a little bit more built in, a little more custom. Um, and so it's probably referring to one of those pieces that's involved in, in doing that um, at the refrigerator space. So great question. Okay. Um, and then Jackie is asking, my final plans don't reflect a cabinet we added to the third bathroom. Should I be concerned? Uh, I, yeah, Jackie, I would, I would without ask. knowing. Yeah, I would ask. Yeah. If, it, if, that, if the third bathroom cabinet is added on the change order or the e-ticket, then um, yeah, you, you certainly can ask your builder or ask your sales consultant. Yep. And they can check the final plans to make sure it's in there. Mm -hmm. And All then right. I did see uh, Diane's, yes, I re I've already received your email and I've already sent it to Nick Yates, our vice president of construction for North Texas for him to look into. So thanks for letting me know. Okay, awesome. Um, Eric, do you want to pull up the A3? 
I've got it. Uh, let me let me go to the super super duper sharing. And here we are. All righty. Okay, so this is an actual customer work copy. Mm -hmm. So yeah, this is the one that they would have sat down with their sales consultant uh, in the office. The sales consultant would have pulled this out or printed it. Hopefully they print it. Um, <laughs> I don't encourage salespeople to keep multiple copies because things change, code changes. Uh, but anyway, so they would have sat down and, and discussed uh, changes that they wanted to make to the plan. Now, from an interior perspective, they didn't really make a whole bunch of changes. Um, and again, you know, going back to those door swings and and header heights and those things, like guys, those are things that our design drafting team have scrubbed clean and they work and they function. So when you start making a bunch of changes, those are things that that can kind of get missed or that you don't think about if you don't do this every day. So I'd just be leery about making a whole, whole bunch of interior changes. Um, but this one, not a lot of interior changes. Uh, they moved some outlets to taller heights because you can see mm -hmm. they need to put 72 inch height here. They, they wanted the um, outlet above. So they're going to mount TVs higher on the wall, it seems, in some of these places, probably. Um, this one, we're not reversing the plan. So we'll notate that. Again, these are the changes that we would make that we're going to give to our design and drafting team uh, to start making the changes. So on the work copy, we would have... Um, for you, for you geometry types that are still watching, we indicate the roof pitch here, which is slope, rise over run. So if your teacher's mm -hmm. teaching you about rise over run, this is where it's used all the time. So this is how steep the roof pitch is. So a 12 on 12 would be a perfect 45 degree angle. Um, that is for every one foot it goes over, it goes one foot down. So perfect 45, um, which this house is from side to side. From front to back, it is not. It is an eight on twelve. Eight on twelve. So it's a little bit shallower slope, front to back. That helps conserve on uh, some some material. Oh, we're, we're highlighting blue and craziness. All right. So the changes in red are the uh, what changes that the customer wanted to make. So this would have had horizontal or uh, lap siding, hardy plank siding. This customer wanted board and bat siding. So they the salesperson has indicated that. Uh, they may draw it on here like this. Some salespeople may not. They may just label board and bat. Either way is, is really good. And mm -hmm. we're doing some little cedar trusses in, in the gables. Um, change the way, change the window layout a little bit here on the front of the house. And again, just indicating that we're doing board and batten all around this particular home rather than horizontal or lap hardy plank siding. Um, again, you got the back of the house as well. All the windows at the same header height uh, in the family room. You got your window there in the utility room, roof pitch, all that stuff is, is indicated on the work copy. And again, this is the one that is sent in to our design and drafting team. You go to the cabinets, same thing. So this is us showing you all the different, uh, the customer. some people call this cabinet elevation. Some people call it a cabinet detail. They mean mm -hmm. the same thing. Remember in elevations, what we're talking about in, in home builder world and, and in architectural world. Uh, an elevation is what a building looks like from a particular side. So this is a front elevation. You know, you got side and rear elevations. You also have cabinet elevations um, or cabinet details. So that's what we're showing you here. You know, his, his, if you're standing at the kitchen sink looking out, this is what you should expect to see. We're giving the radius of this. The framer will use this. To the, they'll usually lay it on the ground. Um, cut the radius out of a piece of plywood to use as a template. Uh, but it, we're saying it's a seven foot one inch radius. So uh, maybe maybe one of the kiddos could could drop in the comments. So if they get back, the teacher can uh, what the diameter of this particular circle would be. And we may have something special for them. Who knows? But um, nice. Anyway, it's uh, it's showing that the framers having to use this information to to cut these radii out um, and make sure they all look the same. We're indicating where the center of the light fixture should be again. So when the electrician shows up. Um, they know how far off the floor because when the electrician gets there to do that, when they're putting the wires through the walls, there's no cabinets there yet. <laughs> there's no sheetrock there yet. There's no sink there for them to center the light fixture on. So they show up and they need to know, okay, seven foot off of the floor and four foot nine inches off of this wall, the middle of a light fixture needs to be there. That's right. where the little light fixture housing will go and the wire will stick through that. So, um, Again, we're just kind of indicating, uh, and from a framing perspective, a framer will need to know that, hey, 
six foot six inches, I need some some cabinet blocking. I need to put some blocking in the two before walls for us to screw the cabinets to. So everything on here means something to someone in the process. Um, and that's why when you start making changes to things, particularly after you sign them, it's really, really important that those changes get fully documented before mm -hmm. it goes out of construction because, man, it's hard to chase these changes down. Uh, once it goes out and make sure that every single person uh, in the process knows. So anyway, all this is on a work copy. That's yep. a work copy. The other thing you'll see on this is every change that you want to make has a number with a circle around it. And we have an accompanying, accompanying sheet that goes with your work copy that explains it in words exactly what you're looking to do. So it's just a double check on our side that we have thoroughly explained everything and we can match everything back to um, where we want the changes to be. Right. So back to the presentation. Back to the presentation. Okay. Well, let me bring that up and we will get back to it. Um, right. I don't know if any questions have popped up while we're. No, just a celebration. We got somebody from California who had their stakeout on Friday. So that's oh, awesome. Cool. So they're, they're banning rain um, for the rest of the time um, oh. so they can get their Travis A built in Fort Bend. Um, they're in Meadville. Awesome. awesome. I don't know about the rain ban. We probably need a little bit, but not quite as much as we got yesterday. Right. That was that was too much. A lot. All right. So the next thing that's going to happen, we mentioned that that the A3 with your accompanying Excel doc that's got everything numbered on it is going to our drafting department. And they're going to look at everything and make all your changes. And what's going to come back is what we call the A6 file copy. So you'll hear us kind of use those words. And these are the plans that you're going to look at for your actual plan approval. So this is going to show every single change that you made. And it also is going to add in some more details. So you're going to actually see the slab plan and the flooring plan laid out for, by room. There's going to be even more things that have those detailed elevations like we showed you with the cabinetry. Um, your electrical plan is going to become its own sheet so you can look at it a little bit easier. Um, and then you're going to have you know, more layout details and, and other elements. Um, and in these plans, it's important that you look at everything that you wanted to change. So you want to review those detail items and changes that may have happened in your color appointment. Like, um, is your window style correct? You know, it, sh it should be reflected um, on the floor plan as being a divided light. If you picked, you know, say prairie, um, it'll still say DL, but when you look at the actual elevation, you should actually see that drawn into the windows. And if you don't kind of raise your hand and say, let's, let's double check everything. Um, you want to look and make sure that all the flooring changes that you requested were made. If you made any lighting changes, make sure that the symbol change, you know, all of that kind of stuff. This is where we're really kind of matching back on those details to make sure everything was caught. I think we'll just jump straight into the real one because the other interesting thing that happens on the A6 is we kind of change what we measure. So when we're looking at the A3 and you're looking at room dimensions um, on you know, our online floor plans, as well as that initial floor plan, we talked about we're measuring the insides of the room. Um, when we get to the A6, we're getting closer to documentation for the framers. So we're actually measuring exteriors at that point. Yeah, and this up. this A six is what you uh, what what the parties are going to sign. So you'll see there's some signature lines over here. So these are the plans. They've, again, they've come back from design drafting. Uh, they've put all they've made all the changes that the customer wanted. So you can see we've got our uh, this is this kind of is like a cover sheet. Um, mm -hmm. So you you'll see that there is a a legend here. We call it no. We used to call it a legend, but you know we got. People get confused with Johnny Appleseed and Bagger Vance and these things. So now they're called notations. <laughs> um, but it tells you what all the little things mean, like what Don's been, been doing, but it can still be a little bit confusing. Uh, any job-specific notes will be located on here, too. So this particular home is being built in a windstorm area. So that's on here. Again, that changes some of the framing requirements. Mm -hmm. A lot of them, actually. Um, there is gas in this particular home. So we're telling you where you have to have a cutoff for the cooktop. And uh, where they this customer wanted four-inch tall cabinet crown molding, a, a bigger, wider cabinet crown um, going all around. Uh, your areas are here, like Don showed earlier, so we won't spend a bunch of time on that. But then uh, as you go by the first page, like she said, the foundation plan is there. So this is what uh, the foundation contractor and actually the plumber will use uh, to locate all of, the, all of the stuff. So your showers, uh, where the walls are going to be for the venting for all the pipes, where the sewer pipes need to go. Uh, again, we don't run a, uh, all the plumbing supply stuff through the slab. The main supply that comes into the house, yes, we do. 
but all the sewer drains, anything that's going to be draining into your sewer or septic system, obviously those are put in the slab. So it's really important that the plumber know where the where all those things need to be. Uh, your kitchen sink, your water heater, secondary bathrooms, primary bathrooms, all that kind of good stuff. But the rest of this is really for the foundation contractor to check their dimensions and for our builder to check uh, the dimensions. And you got an AC pad. So then you'll get the actual the, the, the floor plan, like Don was saying. There's a lot of measurements on here, okay? And so I won't drag it out too much, but you can see that now we're not measuring interior walls. Now all these measurements are really crafted towards an end user framer would be doing. Mm -hmm. um, so for instance, you'll know that some of these measurements are now coming from the outside wall. So from the back of the master bedroom to the middle of this window where they would need to lay this window out is 13 feet, six inches. They do that because a measuring tape has this little thing on the end of it. That little thing is made to hook onto a uh, you got this little thing here on the end, right? You mm -hmm. see that on the measuring tape? That's to hook onto that two by four that's on the ground, that toe plate, and they can hook onto that and then drag their tape so that you don't have to have two people operating a tape. That's why these dimensions go from the outside walls to either outside wall to an inside wall or outside wall to an outside wall or outside wall to the center of a door or window so that a framer can be laying out where that next wall or where that went. And they'll usually mark it on the concrete um, and go from there. But that's that's why. So you wouldn't look at this and be like, oh, this room is is 15 feet, seven inches. Well, no, it's not. Um, it's 15 feet, seven inches minus a three and a half inch wall on this side and a three and a half inch wall here. So really the interior dimension of this will be about 15 feet. So. Okay. Sometimes that can be a little bit confusing, but again, these plans are really, really um, designed for the end user, the framer, what they'll be using to, to build the home. Uh, but the, this is the plan that the customer will, will review and sign. Uh, we've got some notes down here for windstorm. So those are going to be windstorm specific. It has to have, you know, the ply locks clips and some, some not notations on there that, that are required by Texas Department of Insurance um, for windstorm certification. You also got uh, rolling on through here. We got floor covering. So mm -hmm. um, this particular customer opted for some for uh, some vinyl plank uh, uh, in these areas. Your family room, flex room is noted on here, over on the side. So you know, again, we we'll, we can check those with the customer, make sure that that's all copacetic. And you know, you may change this at your design center, your color appointment, um, and that's okay. We don't have to. You don't the, the set that you sign that your options addendum and your change order to, that you're changing to go to wood floors. Let's say you did it in all the bedrooms too, at your color appointment, that will supersede the plants. Um, that's what a, only a change order can do that. And that's what the change orders are for. Right. Um, this is just showing a little bit more zoomed in detail of the master bath again for the framer. This is kind of a, there's a it's kind of a, some complicated walls going on. We got a lot of angles going on. Um, and this is to help them when they're laying out the, the toe plates to, to cut all this stuff and put the doors in exactly how far it needs to be to make everything work out. So the cabinets will work, the tub will work, the shower will work, you know, the door that swings into the water closet, all that. Cause again, none of that stuff is there when the framers frame in the house, right? Doing all of it with the hopes that someday all that stuff is going to be there and that it's all going to fit. Um, so that's why it's really, really important that you don't necessarily have to get into these details as the customer, but if you have questions, that's what it's about. Um, then you move on to the cabinet, uh, details. It's going to look very similar to what's on the work copy, just reflecting any changes that, that, uh, you may have made. Uh, again, like Don said, check, check your swings. Um, we, we lay it out like it's supposed to be, like we know it's going to work. If you change something, you might just want to take, you might just want to double check it. Uh, mm -hmm getting the height of your, of your openings and all of that is on here. Uh, your elevations. So same thing, you're going to sign off on the elevations, make sure that they're the way you wanted them to look. Uh, so you got your board and back here. we got the shutters. There's different details on how we want the shutters to be built or ordered. we got your different plate heights. We've got your roof pitch, your 12, 12, uh, over here. That's side to side, your eight, 12, that's front to back. Um, where the flashing is going to go. We've got that it's a, a slope stone water table here. Your first floor, you know, is here. Then you have an eight foot plate, a nine foot plate, a 10 foot plate in this house. So it, it really does vary across and, it, and those plate heights will actually be, yeah, like an inch and an eighth taller than that. Um, just the way that the math works out. So an okay. eight foot ceiling is really eight foot 
one and an eighth inches or eight foot one and a half in some cases. So um, just a little, little bit of builder trivia there for you. We do try to pre-design where slip joints are going to go when you have masonry walls. So, you know, brick and stone will expand and contract. It's porous. It will hold water. So if water gets in there and then it gets real hot, like on a summer day, it rains and then it warms up to, you know, a hundred degrees of 95% humidity, they could expand what we don't want them doing. Or if, if it rains and it freezes, they can expand. Um, what we don't want two pieces of stone doing is pushing on each other and, and causing it to crack. So right. we will predetermine where it's going to crack. And you'll see come, sometimes we try to do it in a, in a discrete type of area. So like maybe where the, there's a corner. That's what this is. These are inside corners. Um, if there's just one big long wall, sometimes we do have to do it right in the middle of that wall and you'll see us cut and then we'll put silicone in there uh, so that that wall can expand and contract. Okay. Um, what else do we have here? So this will be all of the elevations. So we won't, for, for sake of time, we won't spend the time on every single one of them, but do go through these uh, with your sales consultant page by page. Mm -hmm. I, I mean, I, I would not do this meeting any other way, but in person. Yes. Uh, I, I'm okay with, you know, maybe signing them via DocuSign once, once you're done going through them, but you really want to sit down in person with them on the desk, with the sales consultant, with the work copy that you did in person originally and make sure that all the changes were captured. Salesperson is going to definitely do that before you get there. Uh, they would have reconciled those and made sure there aren't a bunch of errors, but we're humans too. So mm -hmm. uh, sit through and go through it together. And then you have a, an entirely separate page dedicated to the electrical plan. Again, the reason we don't put it all on one page is it would be so cluttered, nobody could read it or make sense of it. So right. electrical gets its own page. So like Don was showing you earlier, all the things, where the light fixtures go. Again, when the electrician's there, there's no sheetrock there yet. Okay. When they're running the wiring, so they need to know exactly where all these are, are going to end up going. Uh, most of them are pretty easy. They center on the room, but some of them, we have to give them a, a start like, Hey, four feet off this wall, five feet off this wall. That's where the first recess can goes and then so on and so forth. Um, same thing. All these, these are all where the, where your GFI outlets are going to be. You got some 220 here. We got a gas stub here. We got a 220 here for your water heater, um, switches, cat five, um, all of that is going on here. Two duplex outlets under the sink. That's for your, uh, disposal and for the dishwasher to plug into mm -hmm. so again, those there's, there's little details that, that matter for everybody in the process. Um, but mainly for, for customers, you kind of want to know, Hey, I wanted to be sure there was a light, you know, in my master closet. Okay. There is this customer added floodlights on all the corners. Wanting yep. just to make sure that those are captured. So here's where they raised the, uh, all the TV and electrical outlets up to 72 inches AFF above finished floor. So again, they want their TV mounted, you know, somewhere around six feet off the ground um, so that the outlets are concealed. You don't have a, you know, a electrical line coming down. Uh, you got motion sensor floodlights that, that the customer opted for here, where the switch is, is going to be for those um, and what all that switch controls. So, Again, you go through these with kind of a fine tooth comb. It's going to take some time to go through them, but it's a really, really important appointment to go through. Um, mm -hmm. any, any questions or comments about that, Don? Um, we have a couple questions. Um, Casey is asking if it's easy to have reinforcements added for a porch swing. Could be Casey, but uh, most cases I see is that they just put them into the ceiling joist themselves. So your porch has ceiling joist up in the framing and you just make sure those eye hooks are in the joist. Uh, you're, you're very, very smart to ask because Hardy mm -hmm. Plank is not designed to hold really anything. Um, it's, it's, it's a fantastic product for keeping water and wind and weather out and it lasts a really, really long time, but it will not hold up a swing. So put them straight into the ceiling joist, you're fine. If you'd be more comfortable or then, then you might... Only thing for a porch swing, I'm not real comfortable doing a flat two by six or, or two by four. I'd want it like this. So maybe if, it, if it's somewhere particular that you want it, you might get there and just nail it between the ceiling joists. Uh, but typically, the ceiling joists are every you know 19.2 inches anyway. So you can you can typically find it the, the some eye hooks that'll work directly in the ceiling joist. The ceiling joists are pretty easy to find um, even after the fact because the on the soffit. While we do nail and caulk, you could typically kind of find one or two of the nails in the caulk uh, where the heart and the hardy is obviously nailed into the ceiling joist. So um, right behind that is going to be a ceiling joist that you can mount that okay. into and should be fine. 
Perfect. You're not going to be pulling cartons or anything out in this in this porch swing, right? Like it's just a swing. So they're they're not meant, they're not designed to hold a tremendous amount of weight, but a swing is not going to be a problem. Okay, perfect. And, I don't blame you. and then Nora is asking why are gutters not included in a build? Well, because Nora, really, we don't know exactly where you're going to do your landscaping. Um, you mm -hmm. know, we don't do landscaping except in a select few uh, areas, like two, uh, in any cities that require them. And in those cases, we can help out with the gut. We can do gutters, um, but not every customer knows how they want their landscaping laid out. So it's really important to know where those downspouts are going to go relative to your landscaping. Um, and we also, if you do them, you need to do the downspouts and you need to do those accordion things that take the water away. Otherwise, you're yes. going to have some significant erosion. Um in one concentrated spot. So um, anyway, yeah, that, that's really wise. We don't really know what your vision is for landscaping. And we find that most of our customers are happier to find out what they're going to do on landscaping and then have the gutters done where they can dictate where the downspouts go. And again, I, I can't emphasize enough, take those downspouts minimum of 10 feet away from that house. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And if you, if you don't like the, the black corrugated, ugly plastic pipe, dig, dig, Dig yeah. you a French pop-up drain um, yep. to get get that water away. You've got to get you know, downspouts are really they're creating kind of a waterfall river effect. You took all the water that was coming and put it in one, so now you've got water running faster and harder and concentrated. So if you don't have it draining properly away from your home, you could be causing a bigger problem than what you started with. Right. So be very, be very careful when doing that. Great question. That. Um, and then we have Maria asking, which is installed first, the sheetrock or the exterior siding? Uh, it, it, either way, it really doesn't matter. Whichever, whichever, typically what's happening these days is whichever of those two contractors are available first and, and, or if the material is there. So, uh, technically when the Tyvek that, which we use when that Tyvek is on, so we got the full OSB wrap and we got the Tyvek on and it's taped up around the windows and we got the shingles on the house or mm -hmm. actually even just the, the, uh, Rhino liner, the house is technically dried in. Right. So, uh, you can you can go ahead and start working on on all the interior stuff on sheetrock and all that stuff. It, it can start being worked on. Um, it's the house is technically dried in, and it's not forever dried in, but it'll last quite a while. I think the Rhino liner is good for sixty days, mm -hmm. uh, even if you don't put shingles on it. It'll do that. So it, we don't. It's not typically going to go that long, but it could um, yeah. if it needed to. That's that's what it's designed for, and particularly right now with contractors being in such high demand and long wait times and. Um, they're all short staffed. Um, sometimes there is more waiting. And if, if we can get the sheet rocker out there before the, either the exterior siding is done or before the mason, brick, the stone or brick mason can show up, we're good to do that because it is in fact dried in at that point. Okay. Perfect. Great question. Um, and then Manuel is asking, are barn days an option Tilson offers as a custom home or is that, an, or is that another thing? Uh, so, I mean, we don't do metal buildings. So that's what you're asking. Mm -hmm. If you're making, if you want the house to look like like a farmhouse, where it's just straight across the front with a shed roof porch coming off of it, I mean, we do that. But we're not going to build a metal building that's 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 a kit, um, and on a slab, and then finish out a, a sheetrock type home inside. That's not what we do. But if you're looking for a farmhouse style, we can absolutely do that. Yeah. All right. And then the last question, Alicia was asking if we build on piers. Yeah. At this time, we do not build on piers. No. All right. And actually Casey snuck in asking if we offer stained concrete floors. And yes, we do. We do. We do. All righty. So then once you have signed off on your plans, um, you're going to get what we call a K1 final plan. Now, full disclosure, you may have other versions of plans um, created for your home because there might be something that we need to submit for ACC approval. But once everything is done, this is your final Final set of plans, um, once you've been released to estimating and all those other steps in our process, this is mm -hmm. the final thing that we're going to do, which is actually putting all the details into your plan. So we're adding things like your utility stub locations, a full roofing plan, uh, the details for how we want everything put together. So this is really the plans that the framers and all of the workmen are going to use to to build your house um, yep. is what's going to happen in a K-1. Um, and this is a set that you'll get in the mail um, from us. And, and also it, it's, it's a little bit, I'm not going to say water. We don't put 19 pages of details in yours because they're generic mm -hmm. details. Uh, so you don't need that, but the stuff pertinent to your plan, um, this is the one that you will get that this, this will be the owner's set of plans, the final plans, the construction plans. Um, All right. And we're going to find and pull up the K1 for this actual home, um, that we we've been are. showing you. So you've kind of been, we've been following the same home through the process. So 
I'll show you what, what the K1 is. Um, I thought you were doing that to make it easier for me. <laughs> I'm trying to fill time, Eric. Don't call me. Oh, on we got clock. time. We're, we're going to keep putting your questions in. We know we're right up against an hour. For those of you who do have, if you have something you're supposed to be doing, you want to go do it for get in trouble. But um, if you want to stick around, please stay. We're going to keep going through this. It won't be that much longer. And do ask all your questions, comments, everything in the chat. We'll still be monitoring it and get it done. So this is the... Yeah. K1, this will be the one. They look very similar to the A6, only you'll notice there's no signature section. It's a done mm -hmm. deal. Yep. We ain't changing anything else. No take backs. No, no take, take backs. backs. We're not making any changes. So um, all the so that front page is the same, so we won't deal with that. Um, you'll see a little bit more detail here on the foundation stuff. We got some diagonals uh, working so that we can get the slab good and square. It's mm -hmm. really important that you start with a square foundation. Um, so you'll see some of that information on, again, the AC, no, in this case, you know, the AC pad moved around. If you remember on the A6, it was back here. So something happened. Maybe the customer was like, I don't really want to be looking out there at that. So we moved it over here. Um, it will also have relevant stub out locations. So here's, um, like this customer's water well is stubbed out here. Hose bib, water stub, well, the gas stub is going to be stubbed out here, although not mm -hmm. the concrete in the wall. Um, so this is where water is coming into the house. Um, there'll be a hose bib or water spigot over here. And again, these things were decided at the stakeout appointment at your site evaluation. Um, and then you got here, you got your septic stub on this side. Again, this is critically important because the plumbers are going to come out and, you know, once the forms are set and the fill materials put in there, then uh, that's when the plumbers show up and, and put all the sewer lines in and, your septic stub and your water stubs and all of that stuff is, is put on the plans. So they've got to have these. You got your uh, shower dimensions because we actually drop the concrete where our showers go. Mm -hmm. uh, we don't use those ugly, cheap acrylic or fiberglass units. Uh, we build a tile pan and and uh, that's so we have to know the, the, the foundation contractor is the one responsible for dropping that shower and doing that. So moving on down, this is going to be very, very similar to the file copy that you did again, the only difference would be your stub outs would be on here. So what changed, they got a little bit of change here. I'll show you on, on the uh, right elevation, but this is where our electricity is coming into the home. Uh, we, because it's a Wayne Scotting, there's some little design details we have to do that I'll show you, but you'll notice the stone stops here. This mm -hmm. is a wood wall. And then the stone picks back up. We have furred this wall out for the underground electricity. So you got a big sweep of gray conduit that's going to be coming up. And then you've got your, your meter can and your breaker box are all going to be sitting in this particular case. Well, your stone sticks out and then the hardy planks back here, you would have an uneven surface. You can't put your box on uneven surfaces. It'll sit like that. So I'll show you kind of what we did to make that work. Um, okay. But these are little details that that matter. It's going to look different maybe than what you saw. Uh, so, so questions to ask. Flooring schedule, you've already seen. Uh, cabinet detail, we have, I think we've beat this horse completely to death, so we won't <laughs> do that. Uh, roofing plan. So again, kiddos, looking at, uh, you know, your roof pitch. We've got different, these numbers going around the side. They correspond to a particular cornice detail. So typically it's one of our generic cornice details. Mm -hmm. Uh we do the best we can to, to make sure that kind of the, the fries taste the same uh, as they say, but try to make sure that the houses look as close as possible to uh, what you may have seen in either one of our pictures, videos, obviously knowing that times change, humans change, code changes. Mm -hmm. um, but so we've put together some details uh, and that's kind of what you're seeing here. There's some little, little details that we give our framers. Hey, here's how we expect the, a, um, you know, a raked cornice to look. Here's how we expect a 12 on 12 cornice to look and be finished out. And it's kind of, you know, Lincoln logs. Hey, you know, stud, double top plate. Here's how many inches. Here's your two before lookout. Here's, you know, here's the order you put it on. So again, trying to take a lot of the guesswork out. That's what slows guys down and really frustrates a, a framing crew is when mm -hmm. you, they don't know how you want it finished. Um, cornice is, is a really important part because it's the details that you're going to end up seeing that are paint caulked and puttied and primed and painted that you're looking at. Um, but here's your 812 porch cornice. Here's your 1212 porch cornice. So again, just these don't matter as much to the customer as they do to the framing contractor. Um, yeah. Just kind of showing them. These are some 
some shear walls, again, that's specific to a windstorm area um, that's required. So not a lot of detail you need to know there. It's just showing the, how, how the framer is going to comply with windstorm shear wall requirements. This is how we want the water table you know, to be framed and how it, the masonry is going to be finished, or even what degree angle that it is, uh, where the house wrap goes, 76 OSB. So again, no, we do the best we can to not leave any guesswork out in the field. Um, right. Once the guys are out there working, you want to be able to work and finish uh, as quickly as they possibly can. Front elevation. So the, again, very, very similar. So the K1, as you notice, what Donna showed, the progression of these plans, it gets more and more and more and more detailed. Right. Um, so that, again, whenever we get out there and start working, every detail is there. It's accounted for. We've gone through and, and ordered based on these plans. These are the plans that our estimating and purchasing teams use to calculate how many of each of the different kind of things we're going to need all the way down to, you know, uh, your ceiling joists and roof rafters. And um, that's what this is. This is a, a framing, a framing plan, a first floor framing, framing plan, which this house only has one floor, mm -hmm. but we even color code the different plate heights uh, for the framer so that they know we label every single uh, joist that we're using. You know, we don't use any pre drill pre done trusses, um, these are talking about how we're going to frame everything, what's going to show up. You'll also notice here, you got a little disappearing stairway in the hallway. That's been on every single plan we've looked at. You see kind of some, looks like chicken wire, but it's really yeah. just ha a, a, a hatch, I think you call it. Anyway, cross hatch. What it's showing you is this will this part of the attic will be decked. We deck this part of the attic because the code requires that you have a catwalk to your mechanical equipment. So we're actually even showing here, it's probably hard to see on screen but there's a little black rectangle here that's mm -hmm. where at least real close to here your hvac equipment's going to be sitting your air handler uh furnace that kind of stuff um heat exchanger it's going to be sitting up here um it's decked all around there and it's decked all the way back that's for safety so that if a service technician gets there has to climb up and walk they're not trying to balance on these um ceiling joists. Yeah. They can walk, they can have space around it to work on it. There's a pan underneath there you have to access. There's some maintenance there you have to do. We have a maintenance video showing that. Uh, it is not for storage of your stuff. Now, it's your house. You're going to do what you're going to do. I get it. But when you see, when the framer's there and they deck it all and then they leave and the HVAC is not there yet, it looks like super awesome for storage. We're going to have all this storage space. And then they show up and put a big AC unit there and duct work all around it. And you're like, oh, that's that's what it's for. Uh, it's yep. for the HVAC uh, and, and service area and code compliance as a catwalk to get to the stuff. So um, can't stop you from putting another plywood up there if you want to. Uh, once, once you're moved in, you know, just be aware that there's these are not designed to carry loads. They, they you know, they're not designed for you to put a gym <laughs> equipment up here or <laughs> anything like that. Like. Mm -hmm. Christmas decorations, stuff like that, within reason, probably fine. Uh, do not store the the weight set that you don't use up here. That's not what it's for. Um, <laughs> store those in the garage. If you have trouble lifting it up that ladder, it shouldn't go up there. It probably shouldn't go there. Exactly. Well said. Well said. Uh, anyway, oh, look, you even have you know live loads and dead loads. So yeah, 10, 10 pounds per square foot for live load, five pounds per square foot. So that, you know it's not designed to hold a bunch of weight. That's not what it's for. Mm -hmm. And then you got the last one is the... Um, rafter layout. So again, this is to remove or minimize confusion for the framers, uh, building superintendent. This isn't stuff that you would need to sign off on. This is just how we're going to frame this house and um, all that kind of stuff. So anyway, Dawn, with that, I want to make sure I covered everything. Stub house, attic decking, AC location, percentage of masonry. Yep. Yeah. I, I'm, I'm... Yeah. Whew. Sorry. That last part was kind of fast. I did it for people's time. <laughs> Questions, right. anything like that. We would love to hear uh, any of the questions that you have. Yeah, we've got Chris saying that UCS says it may be one to two years before they can get pad mount transformers. Yeah, that's yeah so Chris, I, I haven't seen that. I've, I've, I've seen one. So the last I saw was 50 weeks, which is, mm -hmm. that's, <laughs> that's, that's a almost a year. Yeah. yeah. Um, and yeah, man, that's, that's, a, it's a struggle. Um, I don't, I don't know how it's, I don't know how it's going to get fixed. Um mm -hmm. So what he's talking about, guys, is the the transformers. So the kind of the gray or green ones you see on the ground um, that are transmitting power. If you don't have overhead power, those transformers. I've seen it, like you said, a fifty week lead time. Fifty week lead time. It's crazy. Um, 
which which makes planning almost impossible. I mean, and, and you can't build a house without power. You certainly can't live in one without it. So um, that's going to be a struggle. Yeah. So Eric is asking, we, we made the comment that when we get to K1, no take backs, no signatures. She's asking, what are our most common take back issues that arise? Um, I think I mean, we hear about it on here. Maybe door swing um, mm-hmm. might be one. Door swing is one. Um, really, electrical stuff might be, you know, those are ones you really want to pay attention to during your plan approval process would be um, electrical. Um mm-hmm. You know, wanting to have an outlet here or a switch there, or uh, you know, I didn't know there was going to be a ceiling light. That's that's the kind of stuff I can. And really, there's not much because you know, through the whole prospecting part of the process, and even Erica, once you once you buy the home, once you do the contract, there's a lot of detailed conversation. Most of our customers are are pretty. Uh, they know exactly pretty well what they want, and our sales consultants do a pretty good job of of making sure that they at least capture those. I mean, if you if you tell us it's important to you, we're going to go, if, if, if you don't tell us it's important to you, we're probably not going to just show you all the things you could possibly change on a home because it would right. be overwhelming and you would leave cross-eyed and you wouldn't like us anymore. It would be our friend. <laughs> we don't want that. Um, so we want you to be our friend. Yes, absolutely. All right. Cody says he's late and wants us to start over. <laughs> oh, well, good news, Cody. Um, There's a the rewind news, button. Um, this will all be on the website and, and right here where you found us on Facebook later. You can you can watch in the beginning. But very exciting. He put his deposit down on Sunday in San Marcos. Oh, Marcus. congratulations. Looking forward to working with Tilson. Yay. Thank you. Welcome to the family. Um, Will is saying he's got to go. Um, y'all have a blessed day and week. I'm um, got to go do some more farm stuff. Mr. Brom, the steer we got last month has a date Monday morning. Oh. Um, got to get the next set of meat chickens outside in a brooder tote and still waiting for Miss Queenie to have her calf. All right. Okay. We'll keep us posted. Yeah. It's going to be awesome. Um, and then Julie, who gave us the, the mystery refrigerator space numbers. Um, am I to assume a refrigerator is 27 inches deep and 96 inches tall? That seems really tall. Well, so it's not 96 inches tall, and I'm actually going to, I, I, I think I've pulled her plan up. Um, so, so I'm thinking that's the refrigerator surround. So what it is, just, yeah, that's a like filler a piece. One and a that's half a filler inch. piece like you were talking yeah. about. It's an inch and a half wide filler piece. That filler piece, you're right, you're, you're, it's not gonna, your refrigerator is not going to be eight feet tall. Uh, but that filler piece is going to go from the floor all the way up and even to the top of that cabinet that's over your refrigerator. So you'll see mm-hmm. that on yours, there's a 39 inch wide, 24 inch tall, 27 inch deep cabinet above your refrigerator. Um, what you're seeing on the sides of those, those are little basically trim pieces that start at the top of that cabinet and come all the way down to the floor again, to kind of make it look like a, a, a finished built-in refrigerator. Um, and it's, it's talking about, it's 27 the So you're talking right. really only about six feet of space for that fridge, which is about what you need. Yeah. All right. That makes sense. Um, William is asking, what is the process for a hundred percent disabled vet to acquire a Tilson home using the VA? Uh, well, you talk to with our, you just talk with our sales consultants about it. We have, uh, there are programs. We've done those. We've done hundred percent disabled veteran programs. Uh, mm-hmm. it, it does, it's, it's, it has to do with your, your qualification. So, um, but we have done them. I, I know, especially our, uh, Bernie location doesn't because of how many veterans live in and around the San Antonio area, because right. you got Lackland, you got Randolph, um, you got a lot of great medical facilities there, great medical mm-hmm. care. Um, so they do quite a bit of them, but, um, it's, you go through, it's, it's really designed through the lender, um, what the process is. Okay. Um, Julie is asking, what are the rules about us walking through the house during the building process? We'll be living on site and I'm sure I'm going to need rules. <laughs> so don't get in the way. Um, <laughs> I hope that Julie understands like, look, I, I'm better with boundaries. By the way, Julie, yes. all humans do better with boundaries, including kids, especially kids. Um, so rule number one, don't like, Here's my boundary, panic. for instance. I'm told this has to be returned to the front desk. <laughs> I love that. Eric needs rules too. Good thing. <laughs> So I would say rule number one, don't panic. So because you're living on site and this is your dream home and it's very emotional and you've planned out every detail, but it's also going to be the first time that you've seen a major purchase get built in front of your eyes. So keep in mind, everybody's human. Mistakes are going to get made and don't panic until your builder says it's done. Like, and it's not, if it's not the way you want it. So they're going to make mistakes. We're going to fix them. 
Um, it's going to happen. So just keep calm. That, that would be my com- communicate and be, be patient with everybody. Yeah. There's, there's um, a reason, Julie, that very few restaurants allow you to watch your food be made. Like yes. the ones that need your input specifically subway, Chipotle, free birds. Yeah. I mean, you're going to get, but you ain't seeing Chick-fil-A make your dinner. You're not going to see Applebee's. You don't want to see Applebee's make dinner. <laughs> you, I mean, it's not forgive me, any Applebee's people, <laughs> fans, if there are any true ones. Um, I don't, I don't do, I don't do chain restaurants. It's not my thing. Don knows this. It's a yes. running joke. Eric is, is I don't very much not the chain restaurant guy. No, no. Take me to a hole in the wall any day of the week. So, but okay, also I don't want, I don't want to see in their kitchen either. The point being like your car, you didn't see your car get made. It just showed mm-hmm. up at the showroom floor. It was done. You didn't get to see the robots on the line, making all the welds and sparks flying everywhere and a window maybe getting dropped and broken. And then the guy's delivering the car to the dealership. He backs it off into one of those gigantic yellow concrete poles straight to the body shop before we take an inventory, buff it all out, maybe replace the bummer, maybe fix it. You didn't see all that. All you saw mm-hmm. was pretty new car. The beautiful floor, car on the showroom floor. Done. Yeah. Um, that ain't the case when you're building a home. You're going to get to see it all. So the, the short answer is it's unrestricted access. Right. Use your head. It is a job site. There are some unsafe situations. Um, so just be careful uh, when you're out there. There are nails. There are loose boards. There is bracing. Don't mess with any of the bracing. It's there for a reason. It's holding things up before mm-hmm. we get the house all wrapped in the OSB and the roof on and all that. Like, Bracing matters. Don't mess with it. Don't let kids mess with it or around it. Um, don't let your kids out there without being supervised for sure. Mm-hmm. Um, Cause it's, it's dangerous. It's, it's a job site. So just like you wouldn't let them run around a playground without being supervised. And the playground is designed to be kid safe. Okay. Yeah. Um, this is a playground with nails. This is a playground <laughs> with nails. So anyway, all that to say, Don said it very, very well. Just, uh, understand take a breath and understand that it is a process mm-hmm. and uh, it it's not done until it's done right so oh and foundation day get everything way 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 far away from the house because they're <laughs> don't don't put anything important anywhere near near the house like put it in a safe area put it behind what you're living in on site um because they're going to come at oh dark 30 and they're going to be zipping so yeah, there's just 80 000 pound trucks that, that keep, are keep your stuff safe yeah. Yeah. Good advice. Great All advice. All right. Um, Gina is asking, I was told our water heater would be located in the attic. Are there adjustments to the size of rafters to hold the oh, weight? That's a great question, Gina. Great so question. actually what they do is they they dig uh dig. <laughs> <We do frame. laughs> so they dig in your attic. <laughs> we do frame a platform for that. And, and same thing. If 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 the water here's in an attic, it it too has to have a catwalk going to it. Mm-hmm. Um, so it'd be kind of a plywood decking and yes, there will be additional framing, um, there to hold the weight of the, of the water heater. The water heater itself doesn't weigh a whole lot. The water here went full of water weighs a significant amount. Um, right. you figure you're about eight pounds per the gallon of water, a 40 gallon water here. That's 320 pounds of water, probably plus another, you know, 50 or 60 pounds of water heater. So it's, it, oh, wow. it's yeah. a little under 400 pounds of weight sitting in a 18 inch diameter area kiddos. So um anyway all, all that to say yeah there's a little bit a little more framing uh under that to hold it okay all right casey is asking what is the time frame from contract signing to site visit to looking at plans we signed our contract on saturday oh so we signed this is the future tense yes future tense i think anyway so oh, we sign our contract okay you're right yeah um it happens once once a year i was right <laughs> Not just today, april the 26th the uh so it varies a little bit uh, based on where you're building. You know, if it's a if it's a city, we got to do more details on the plans. It may take a little longer. Uh, but typically, contract signing a site visit that right now that's happening in in about three to five weeks. In some cases, less, but about three to five weeks, um, as long as your site is ready to be evaluated. Um, and then plans are are happening simultaneously. So mm-hmm. drafting starts, working on the plans as soon as a sales consultant finishes making whatever changes to make into that work copy and sends it to our uh, design and drafting team for them to start working on to James Sheblack and his guys and girls um, to, so that's about a, it's hard to, I would say that's about a six to 10 week time mm-hmm. frame. In some cases it's less. Um, it, it really just depends on what level of detail, number of changes, complexity of, of uh, the design and, and changes that were made. Okay. 
All right. And let's see. Shwante was saying she was also running late with Cody because her frame is going up on her San Jacinto and Sugarland. So awesome. Well, cool. Um, and then, the 3D version of the plans then. I know. She can go go compare it and then her builder will really love us. Um, <laughs> Sam and Samika are asking, do you take deposits before or after design meetings? Uh, so the deposits are taken. Well, I mean, we, so we'll meet with you for, for nothing um, for, yeah. for free. Because we love you, we want to see it you. It depends upon what you mean about design meetings. So if you're talking about when we're looking at your plan and kind of drawing up what you want, and trying to get you a price, we do all of that before, usually before the deposit, um, to kind of because we have to know what you know. You you do your deposit at contract um, when you sign an agreement with us, so we have to have a price to put on the agreement. So we've got to do some of it before we take the deposit, if that makes sense. Um, your color appointment design meeting where you're actually picking out the finishes and the products for your home happens after, after your deposit. And obviously the signing of the plans, like what we're yeah. talking about there, that's, that's after, you know, we will not work on our plan. Your plans will not go to our drafting department without a deposit. Maybe right. That. Yep. Help a little. All right. Um, Nancy is asking, let's see. Um, can you tell me of a fireplace built into your homes? So we'll have a stone brick chimney coming out of the roof. Not typically, no. Um, we can in places that require that. Uh, mm -hmm. There are some or customers that request it. The chimney is typically not coming. The full masonry days are over. Like building full masonry, going all the way up, you can't build them and meet the energy code anymore. Yeah. Um, they're they're too porous. They 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 leak. Um, so that's that's not a thing anymore. They leak air and they leak water. Um, what is what what can be done um is and it's not this what i'm showing done that's for a question okay. later. um what what can be done though is you can have the the chimney with a with a brick or masonry or stone veneer um so and there are subdivisions that require that they, they don't want any kind of wood chimneys which they include that to be hardy plank so in those areas yeah we do have a a veneer the stone manufacturers make a, a thinner stone a lighter stone that we can apply almost like a stucco. So we do like a, a scratch coat and we can stick the stone on there to where it looks though, like it's mm -hmm. uh, a mason, what well, is a masonry, but it's not a full masonry chimney. Like okay. you can see in an older home where the, the fireplace and the chip, like you see an old home is burned down and the whole, the chimney and the- The chimney's the, the last the, piece standing. <laughs> the last, yeah, that, those days are over. That's not a thing anymore. Great question. All right, awesome. Um, then we've got Jesse saying, I want to thank Tilson Homes for being so amazing to work with um, from the processes and the videos full of information and customer experience. My daughter was so excited for the Easter fairy to catch her first Easter egg hunt at our soon to be new home. Um, she's, Tilson is truly a great family to be a part of. Oh, thank you, Jesse. Yeah, I know Peyton had a great time um, being being Easter, Easter fairy for you and a bunch of other customers up in the in the Bernie area that are that are waiting for foundations. So yeah. that was super fun. Thank you for sharing that. Yeah. Um, Doug is anxious to plan our LaSalle to build next year. Awesome. Doug, we don't want you to be anxious, brother. We want you to be excited. We don't want we to do. cause anxiety. We don't want to do <laughs> I give my mom a hard time. She says that too. Sure, I'm anxious to see your kiddos. I'm like, my kids give you anxiety? <laughs> well, the I've answers, met yeah. your kids, yeah. The answers, yeah. <laughs> No, they're lovely. They're lovely. Um, <laughs> Ashton is asking, what is the time frame at this time that you guys are saying? Uh, I'm telling people 18 to 24 months. Mm -hmm. um, you know, Obviously, we have a lot of them that are happening in less than that. But it's, guys, stuff is so unpredictable right now. People, promises, and products. Okay, those are those are things that are in in short supply these days. Um, it, it's very very difficult to get people to show up. They're very busy. It's mm -hmm. very difficult to get supplies. Um, and when you can get them, they're very expensive. And you can get the supplies, but you can't get the people. It's not the same week. So. Yeah because of all that unpredictability and I'm done with the alliteration of the letter P, but 18 to 24 months. And again, with our business model guys, the faster we can do, get it done, the better, you know, we're, we're giving you, we're locking you in on that price that we don't get paid for until the house is completely finished. So obviously mm -hmm. we want it done. Um, it helps works for our little business to get money in when we close houses. Like that's how we pay people. We enjoy um, money. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> it certainly helps. Certainly helps when the bills come in. Yeah. All right. Um, Casey is asking, where are the breaker boxes typically located, inside or outside? So it's it depends, Casey. It's about 50-50. Um, so on the, you can share what I've got. I, I, I promised that I would show this, and then I didn't show it because, you know, that's what we do. Promises, like I said, short supply. Um, <laughs> so this is an instance where we had to do – so this customer didn't have a garage, if you recall. It, mm -hmm. The code has gotten pretty – 
clamp down on where you can put the, the electrical code, the national electric code, uh, where you can put a breaker box. So it can't right. be within so many feet of, of any appliance that has its water. Okay. Well, that takes away pretty much the utility room, right? Because you got right. this thing called a washing machine sitting in there that it's hard to get away from that washing machine in a utility room. They're really not that big. So mm-hmm. it makes it tough in there. So really it's about where, and if you do put it in living area, it has to be in its own like closet. So you can't just put it in the middle of a wall in a hallway anymore. It has to be in its own um, closed space. So basically a garage is about the only place it can go and be inside. That's okay. Uh, and we do locate a number of them inside garage walls. Mm-hmm. When, but uh, we do a lot of them that they go outside. And so that's here. You know, we have the stone wainscot here with the board and bat hardy above. Very popular look. The electrical is coming on the side. Again, they don't they don't have a garage on this home. So the electrical is mounted. The breaker box is outside. So the meter can will be here and breaker box here. And, it, and, and again, you're not going to be going to the breaker box very often. At least you shouldn't be going to breaker box very often. If you do, call us because something's wrong. Um, and... and we do know that there's a lot of people I've heard that people get concerned about, well, I don't want somebody to be able to cut power to my house. And, and, you know, well, the reality is if you have an inside breaker box, the national electric code requires that you have some type of a cutoff outside somewhere. So oh, okay. <laughs> great news. They can still cut power. It's for the fire department. If they show up, the first thing a fire department is going to do is want to cut power to that house. They're not going to go in that there fire hoses blazing on a house on fire that has a lot of electricity. So they're going to cut power to the house anyway. And it may be at your transformer. It may be at your um, meter can, but if not, it's going to be on the outside of that house somewhere at do a cutoff. So um, it's about half and half. Um, it, but typically if you do want it to be on an inside wall, it's going to have to be in a garage. Okay. And Casey is apologizing for her million questions. Please do no. not apologize. That is why no. we are here. We do not you should have apologies. you should have a million and one questions. If you, if you don't, you haven't done enough research. So um, please ask away. That's what we're here for. Um, and then Ashton is asking me to do some math for her. So I'm going to have to do this afterwards and get back to you because um, she wants to know the square footage of her plan. It wasn't on her form since she made changes and it hasn't come back from drafting yet. So I have the same form you have. Um, so I will do some math for you. And, or, and well, you, or you hit up your sales consultant. and Get, have to, them get, you, the, get you the estimate afterwards. We'll send yeah. you a message. And that is the last question I see. Okay. Well, guys, thanks for hanging in there with us. Um, again, shout out to Ms. I think it was Gardner's class. Um, for, for watching. Thank you all for watching. We hope this was informative for you. Obviously, this is not where it has to end. You can mm-hmm. find us on our website, find us on Facebook, YouTube. Uh, we have 12 design centers open seven days a week that we'd love to sit there and talk to. We got new home. Um, <laughs> no, we all new, have home new home specialists program. waiting to yeah, answer all your questions specialist. online. Yes, we'll answer your question. Uh, Faith was watching earlier. So anyway, Ask us anything you like. We want to be sure that you have all the information that you need because we do. We know this is a lifestyle that, that a lot of people want. Um, mm-hmm. And we know that we're a really good team to be able to help you do that. So if there's something you want to reach out to, do reach out to us. Um, and between now and then, we just hope to make you part of the Tilson family. We'll see you all later.